Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's video is going to be on a very interesting hemodynamic aspect of constrictive pericarditis. This is an intraoperative picture of the heart wherein this is the actual myocardium which is being surrounded by a thick calcific cage of constrictive pericarditis. So let's mind map today's video. We're going to be talking about the hemodynamics of the pericardium, more specifically the hemodynamics of constrictive pericarditis. And for your active recall, these are the four questions. The first question is, what are the two main effects of constrictive pericarditis? Now, this is the crux of this topic, really. Number one is dissociation of intrapericardial and intraventricular pressures. And second is ventricular interdependence. Now, what do, what do these mean? We'll talk about it soon. Now, this is the same picture that I had shown in the introduction, the thick calcific pericardial shell and the myocardium. So, when I play the video, you can see that this thick shell is so resistant that it, it is causing the myocardium under it to become extremely constrained. And if you pay attention, this is the sound that is made when you hit upon this shell. So now let's see the effects of this thick pericardial shell on the various hemodynamics. So what is the effect of a thick pericardium on intracardiac blood flow during respiration? So let's start with inspiration. When you inspire, there is an establishment of negative intrathoracic pressure. So outside this is the thorax. Uh, this black line is actually the thickened pericardium and it is restraining this heart with its myocardium within it. So when you have a negative intrathoracic pressure, that is negative pressures outside, this negative pressure gets transmitted only to two structures. Number one is the pulmonary veins which drain into the LA and second is the superior vena cava. Since these two structures are not constrained by the thick pericardium. This negative pressure, however, is not transferred to either the inferior vena cava or to any of the heart chambers. So that can be made out by these red dots. So essentially what it means is there is more negative pressure in these two structures that is pulmonary vein and SVC and relatively positive pressures in the rest of the cardiac chambers and the IVC since there is no transmission of this negative pressure. So let's assume all the pressures here to be zero and here the pressures to be below zero. Now whenever there is blood flow, you would expect the flow of blood to occur from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. Now in the case of pulmonary vein to left atrium, Blood flow will not occur from the pulmonary vein to the left atrium because it is in an opposite direction. The gradient is not from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. In fact, there is a lower pressure here and a higher pressure relatively in LA. So that would impede blood flow. So less blood flow is suggested by these red arrows. That means there is a little impediment or stoppage of this blood flow. So because of this, on inspiration, as the negative th intrathoracic pressures only go to these two structures, there is reduced pulmonary vein to LA flow. As a result, there is reduced LA to LV flow, which is reduced mitral flow. Now, because there is overall less flow on the left side on inspiration, and because this entire cardiac chamber now behaves as one because of the constraint by this thick pericardium, this left ventricle sucks the pressure towards it. And as a result, the septum gets sucked towards the left ventricle. This is one manifestation of interventricular dependence, which is normally not seen in normal people. 
when the septum moves to the left there is increased flow on the right side now how does this increased flow occur the rv and as a result the ra is able to suck extra blood only from the ivc because the ivc has not gotten the negative intrathoracic pressure trans transferred to it so the ra and the rv can suck the blood from the ivc however it is unable to do so from the svc because as we've already established the negative intrathoracic pressure has transferred to the svc as well and hence there is less flow between svc to ra so these are the events which occur during inspiration reduced flow on the left side reduced flow between svc ra increased flow between ivc ra and rv and the shifting of the septum towards the lv all of this because of this thick shell of constrictive pericarditis so obviously opposite events will occur during expiration during expiration the intrathoracic pressure will become relatively positive which will get transferred to only these two structures that is pulmonary veins and the superior vena cava the pressures in the chambers and the ivc will be unchanged but now because there is a pressure gradient between a relatively positive pulmonary vein and a relatively negative or a lower pressure in the left atrium there will be increased flow which is shown by the green arrow so increased flow on the left side increased flow between the pulmonary vein and left atrium between the left atrium and the left ventricle and also increased flow between the svc and ra which is opposite to what happened during inspiration now the septum gets pushed to the right side because of excessive flow on the left again evidence of interventricular dependence which is seen classically in constriction so overall the flow on the right side now decreases and however the flow between the svc and ra increases but that is not enough to increase the overall flow in the right sided chambers now that we've seen the effects of this thick pericardium on intracardiac flows let's see what happens on intracardiac pressures during the various phases of respiration first let's see what happens in normal people now with inspiration both the right ventricular as well as the left ventricular pressures decrease now why does this happen essentially because the pericardium is normal in normal people there is a direct transmission of the negative intrathoracic pressure through the pericardium into these chambers leading to a drop in pressure this is the first and important reason one thing to note is with inspiration the venous return to the right side increases so that leads to increased flow in the right sided chambers so increased tricuspid flow however this increased flow does not translate into increased pressure on the right side because of the reason of this transmission of negative intrathoracic pressure secondly another reason why the left ventricular pressures drop is when there is an increased venous return with inspiration the pulmonary artery is a very compliant structure and it allows itself to store this extra venous return in itself so as a result because of this storage of blood there is less venous return to the left side of the heart so less relatively less flow on the left side of the heart and overall lower pressures on the left side of the heart during inspiration now let's come to constriction so what happens with chronic constrictive pericarditis the right ventricular pressures increase and the left ventricular pressures drop and this is evidence of a classic discordance of the rv and lv pressures with inspiration normally there is a concordance where both the ventricular pressures drop with inspiration but here the rv pressures rise so what is the cause first is because of the constriction itself there is no transmission of the negative intrathoracic pressures to either the rv or even the lv so what is seen in normal is no longer now seen in chronic constrictive pericarditis second there is an increased tricuspid flow which 
occurs from the inferior vena cava during inspiration and it goes to the right ventricle so because of increased flow from ivc to ra the ra pressures that is the right atrial pressures also increase the superior vena cava pressures also increase and why is that we have already seen that there is a decreased superior vena cava to right atrial flow because there is transmission of this negative pressure to the svc there is no flow gradient established between the svc and the ra so overall because of decreased flow into the ra overall the raised svc pressure is established and this is what we call clinically the kusmal sign wherein with inspiration there is increased in the jugular venous pressure now what happens on the left ventricle in constriction we've already seen that there is decreased mitral flow and as a result there is septal bowing towards the left side so overall the left ventricular pressures drop and the right ventricular pressures increase leading to a discordancy with inspiration on expiration opposite events occur wherein the right ventricular pressures drop and the left ventricular pressures rise again keeping the discordancy intact so we have understood the dissociation of the intrapericardial and intraventricular pressures because of this thickened pericardium and the second main effect of constrictive pericarditis was ventricular interdependence and we've touched upon it a bit while we were explaining the other hemodynamics so what is ventricular interdependence when the left ventricle and the right ventricle are constricted within a stiff shell of pericardium so that the change of volume in one chamber reflects upon the other and that is what we saw with changes of volume seen with different phases of respiration so this is an echocardiographic example in which with inspiration there is a shift of the septum to the left and with expiration the septum shifts towards the right this itself is a manifestation also this is also known as septal bounce is a manifestation of ventricular interdependence and the second manifestation is the discordance of lv and rv pressures with respiration which we just saw previously wherein there is a rise in rv pressure and a drop in lv pressure with inspiration with opposite events occurring on expiration to give you an idea of what septal bounce looks like this is an echocardiographic video which shows the left atrium the left ventricle and the aorta this is the mitral valve this is the aortic valve and this is the septum so pay attention to how the septum moves so here you can see that the septum is shuddering certain areas of the myocardium of the left ventricle as well as of the right ventricle are looking constrained by a thick pericardium this is a thick pericardium some amount of pericardial effusion is also present so when you see this picture wherein the septum is shuddering or bouncing you should evaluate this patient for constrictive pericarditis so now we've talked about the various flows and the pressures especially the systolic pressures in the cardiac chambers with constriction but what happens to the diastolic pressures in constrictive pericarditis so what happens is there is raised and equalization of the diastolic pressures in all the four cardiac chambers as well as the mean wedge pressure and the diastolic pa pressure so you'll have to watch the next video for part 2 of hemodynamics of constrictive pericarditis as always like share subscribe comment and press the bell icon and i'll see you next time with another video